Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Tuesday Live. And today, Jen and I have a really special guest that we're super excited about. Um, an insurance expert that we have here who is licensed in multiple states and is really a wizard on how to do your creative real estate when you're insuring these deals. You hear a lot of, you know, is this the right way to do it or, or not the right way to do it? Well, it's time to bring an expert into the arena to give you the real in, ins and outs of how to do it. So we are super happy to have you. Thank you, James Jenkins, for having us or having you on today. Excellent. Thanks for the invite, you guys. I really appreciate it. So <clears throat> a lot of folks maybe not know who you are. Some, I know a lot do. You're very popular, especially on social media. I know that's how I found you. You yeah. uh, corrected me in a Facebook group. And I was like, well, who is this guy? And then I was like, man, he really knows his stuff so much that we're going to start doing our business with him. And we do. So what was it, uh, was it Pace's group? I forget where we met each other. It was, it was, it was something to do with, um, Having the seller, and we'll get into that, is how to oh, set yeah. insurance the right way. And you're like, let a pro handle this. I'm like, well, then please, let's see what you got. And then you did. And I was Man, really happy with those results. So, I, And the thing is, I'm not even the pro anymore. It, I, I still know how to do my stuff, but we have hired some great ladies at the team here at Riskwell. You and, and Jen don't even talk to me anymore because the, the ladies on my team are fantastic. And if I get in their way, they get real crabby and just basically say, hey, go away. We got it. Shoot. Go do CEO stuff. So it's it's great the way that scale happens. I know we're all growing our business and whether it's the size of a portfolio or the team around you, uh, this, man, we eat, sleep and breathe this stuff. Other than my kids and the golf course, I don't really have any hobbies. Like risk and insurance is really interesting to me. I I always get annoyed when someone's like, well, the insurance is boring. I don't want to talk about insurance. And especially other agents, like a lot of insurance agents like, well, I know it's not the sexiest thing, but oh, you want to talk about your insurance? It was like, hold on a second. The insurance world has an optics problem and people actually believe that. And take, a, take a second and, and pause and think, would you ever buy an investment property without knowing that insurance was a thing, that if something happened to it, your investment would be protected? Probably none, right? You don't want to be on the hook for the full value of the property or anything that happens on the property, slip, trip, and fall. Somebody had, you know, throws a party and uh, they have a rager and then somebody gets in a car and drives down the street and kills someone. You got a host of liquor liability claim, assault and battery, discharge of a firearm. You know, there's so many different things as real estate investors where you're not even really thinking about it, but you're leaning on a good insurance program to protect your cash flow, protect your investment, and help ensure your business's success. I, I argue anybody that says insurance isn't exciting is like risk and insurance is the foundation of modern society. Name me one industry that doesn't rely on risk and insurance to do what they do. I'll wait. Name one industry. You won't be able to find one because every industry relies on good risk and good insurance to do what they do. So there you go. That, that's my soapbox moment for this call. Um, and I think that's a great context to start us off in. I know you guys have some questions. And of course, we'll involve the uh, the audience here. Um, I'll say right now, just early in the recording, for those of you watching on a recording later on, happy to answer any questions you guys have. Uh, we, we have a, a million questions, as you can imagine, especially in the creative financing world, because there's so many ways to do it wrong. Most insurance agents have no idea what they're doing, but the problem is they're good at selling and they'll never have the honesty, the ethical uh, qualities, the intestinal fortitude, as my grandfather used to say, to be honest with you and say, you know, I'm totally winging it. I have no idea how to set up your sub two the right way. Um, you don't want to find out the hard way after the fact or have someone do something oopsie and then a do on sale clause gets called and your lender gets all up in arms. That's kind of worst case scenario. So uh, we're happy to answer all the questions for our current clients. As you can imagine, uh, there's a lot that goes into setting up a sub two policy. So uh, once that first policy is is bound and, and we have a, re a relationship of some sort, we're happy to get all the way into the details. Um, we don't do that for people that aren't, you know, at least one property in 
uh, with risk. Well, otherwise we'd just be answering questions from sub two rookie investors all day, every day. And you can imagine how much fun that would be. Uh, hit us up at REI at riskwell.com. If you are watching the recording, for those of you live right now, well, we're just get into it. So, uh, yeah, you, you guys want to kick us off? Yeah, well, and you know, you brought up a really good point. When you're buying these creative finance deals, rather you're buying it, you know, on a wrap mortgage subject to however you're doing it, you know, everybody fears what's called that due on sale clause is, yep. you know, the bank has the right to call the loan due if they see, you know, the sale happen and them not get paid off. So there's usually a few things that can trigger that. And the first one, which is sometimes the most obvious, is if you're not making the payments on time. So yep. if you buy the property and you're not making the payments on time, now that file gets in front of somebody's face, a live human being. Now they're going to start analyzing it. It's a we great don't want that. <laughs> you don't want that happening. So that's a great way to have the loan called due. And then the second way, which is also the one of the most popular ways to have the loan called due is by not having the set up, uh, set up insurance the correct way. Yep. Not having the proper insurance. And so we don't understand the intricacies of how important that is. And um, and how to make sure that you're covering yourself, covering the previous seller, having the right insurance, who's paying the claim if there is a claim. And I will say James hit it spot on because Jen and myself now have had two claims against us. Um, one, somebody slipped and fell delivering a refrigerator in the driveway and the delivery guy who slipped and fell. Um, we didn't know about the lawsuit until a year and a half after the accident actually happened, the incident happened. Nobody informed us that it even happened. So we're living our lives for a year and a half, not even knowing there was an issue until we get a letter in the mail, right? So that can be scary. If you don't have the right insurance, it's even scarier. Yeah. Um, number two is we had a fire at one of our properties. Tenant left bacon on the stove and walked out the door to work, thought the stove was off. And guess what? She wasn't. She was still on. And now we had a small fire in that house. And we've learned a lot. Once again, thank goodness we had insurance set up the correct way to where really, I mean, we were collecting rent the whole time because we had loss of rent coverage. We had full replacement coverage, which I know when you talk to James and his crew, they're going to make sure they get you set up with the, the best policy possible. Yep, so full coverage, um, you know, you could get into it yourself, James, but you know, the long and short of it is if you have a claim, you're not getting the stuff prorated. They're giving you full reimbursement of what it costs to get it built brand new again. So when they're tearing out drywall from just a small kitchen fire, boy, does that bill get to be expensive quickly. Well, and the, the problem with fire is not the fire itself usually. And it's not even the smoke that's associated with the fire. It's all the damage the dadgum fire department causes when they come in and start spraying water freaking everywhere. Is I don't know if you uh, ever thought about it, but those fire hoses put out several hundred gallons of water a minute. And that water goes somewhere and it's going somewhere you don't want it to go. So it's like, okay, cool. My fire, my property didn't burn down because of a fire, but now the fire department caused way more damage than the fire ever caused. So we have collateral damage to deal. Yeah, yeah those that's darn exactly hose what pullers. To us. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Ours was a small kitchen fire, charred the cabinets. That was it, but yeah, broke a lot of windows. Luckily, this house had a basement. It was in upstate New York, so the water went into the basement, but it went right over the furnace and hot water tank. And <laughs> man, and so, you know, you guys, you bring up a good point there because you know, in parts of the country where basements are prevalent and sump pumps are a thing, you got to make sure you're adding that additional coverage for a uh, reverse flow and sump pump overflow and whatnot. You know, a lot of the country doesn't have basements and we typically don't sell uh, a lot of that uh, reverse flow and, and sump pump overflow discharge endorsement. Uh, basically anything involving uh, a malfunctioning sump pump, um, you got to have that extra coverage because most policies don't cover it by default. You need to make sure that that's added in in some parts of the country, that's not a problem. And others, it really is. So, And I had a friend who had that claim. His uh, sub pump he didn't know wasn't working in an upstate New York. And during rainy season in the spring, when all the snow is melting and you're getting a lot of rain, his basement got filled up. And by the time he realized how much water is down there, uh, it was significant. It was a finished basement. So everything had to come out. Oh, man. And That's why you buy good insurance, folks. That's one of the great opportunities to have a difference between covered and not covered. Right. Um, Joseph, I don't mean to pick on you. Uh, you just gave me a great example of one of my favorite things to talk about. You use the term fully covered. 
And that is not language you will ever see on an insurance policy. There is covered cause of loss. There's typically three versions of it. Uh, they are bad, slightly less bad, and, and good uh, in the way that we approach them. There is basic, there is broad, and there is special. They literally just stair-step. Basic is the really bad when you only have eight major weather perils covered. Uh, things like fire, sudden discharge uh, of um, uh, water, it just the, the basics, absolute basic coverage. That's why they call it basic form. Broad form cause of loss has slightly more coverage, but what you want to see is special form cause of loss. And what that means is if it's not excluded and it falls under the insuring agreement on the policy, then unless it is excluded, it is covered by default. It's uh, otherwise known as an open peril policy. A lot of insurance agents will get lazy with their words and say all perils policy. And that is not true. It is an open peril policy, which means if it's not excluded from coverage, then it is by default covered if it falls under the scope of coverage, meaning that it's you know commercial property coverage or residential occupancy, whatever it happens to be. So when you're looking at these quotes, you want to make sure that you're getting special form cause of loss. It's going to pay the broadest possible uh, coverage uh, form for the policy, which just means the all the weird stuff, all the weird stuff, any crazy story you've heard from an investor, it's probably something that is covered on special form cause of loss and is not covered on basic and broad. So, so and you bring up a very good point <clears throat> because just because you have the least... It, you know, expensive insurance policy is a far cry from having the best insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to try to save a few hundred dollars a year being a cheapskate, or even if it's a thousand dollars you're trying to save per year, even if it's even more than that, yep. one insurance claim could be all the difference in the world is by having the best insurance and having it proper. And it's really to protect yourself. Yep. It's insurance to protect yourself. And it's always never, you know, I expected this fire to happen or this flood to happen, or I could see this happening, right? It's, it's unexpected events. So when you get hit off guard, it's great to know because insurance companies, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they usually don't want to pay. And it's almost every single time they do not want to pay. So you want to make sure that you, you cover yourself by getting the best coverage you can. So that's a lot less li likely to happen, especially under the right circumstances. You know, with our situation, our renter brought her own stove in. So, because the renter brought their own stove and admitted to it, her insurance covered the policy, covered yep. the entire thing. Well, and and uh, brings up a good point. This feels like a good time to ask it, uh, to answer it. And, and Jay, I see you got several things there in the chat. We're going to get to those in order in just a second here. Um, if you have a tenant occupying your property, uh, one of the things that we strongly, strongly recommend is that you require a tenant. Uh, insurance for that property. It's typically referred to as renter's insurance. There's two important things that that policy does, one of which you don't care about at all, and one of which you care about a great deal. The first is the personal property of your tenant, and the second is legal liability coverage uh, from the tenant to you. So if they are negligent in any way, uh, if something happens under their watch, their policy responds first and yours is second. The cost difference between the minimum coverage, which typically is $100,000 in liability coverage, and the maximum, which typically for your usual suspects, your travelers and Allstate and State Farm and Farmers and whatever, whatever the carrier is, $500,000 in liability coverage is usually the most they're willing to do for renter's policy. The difference in cost to your tenant usually 40 50 bucks a year at most so wow. you you want to be requiring in the lease it says thou shalt get renters insurance thou shalt name us as additional insured the great thing here is if you have a renters insurance in place a whole lot of things that would fall to your policy fall to theirs and your policy that you have as the owner of the property goes into what's called an excess position. The renter or the tenant is in a primary position and your policy is in an excess position, which means that unless something exceeds the limits 
of the primary layer of insurance, your policy is never touched. So you get to have nice rate stability and make it someone else's problem, which is my favorite kind of problem. That is fantastic. <clears throat> Guys, if you didn't pick up on that, if you're going to watch this on the rewind, lay that back. That was gold, what you just shared with us there too. Because you don't think about it, but once you get that claim on your insurance, obviously you think your insurance is going to stay low or you think it's going to go up. You have continual yeah. policies. You're going to have even more issues or you know continual claims. So to like what James just said, make that problem their issue and not yours all the better because you're spot on. It was about two weeks before Christmas and I get a call from our insurance agent saying that you're getting your $1,000 deductible back because it went on the renter's insurance policy, this big claim for the fire damage. Yep. So we even got our deductible back and it went against them. So that is spot on if you don't have your insurance set up that way. And I know that we are taking notes personally. Um, so I also want to talk about you. What states do you cover? I mean, I don't need you to say them all, but. Sure. We're in the entire country except for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we just got active in Washington State because we got, finally got enough business up there. What we're looking for uh, is $10,000 in revenue on an annual basis. So when we have enough interested parties that it looks like we're probably going to have 10000 in revenue from a state, we go active in that state. We got across that threshold uh, for Washington State, uh, which for the longest time has been on our you know, our small list of we don't operate there. Uh, now, it, I think we're down to Idaho and Montana uh, that we're not in up in that part of the country. And then in New England, uh, we got New York, obviously. Um, we we still have five states in New England. We're not in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. So six states, I apologize. Those six states in New England, we are not. We're in the rest of the country. Well, I'm buying a deal in Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to round up some more. I know a few guys there who do a lot of these deals too. So yeah. Um, maybe For the time being, I, I have a, a close colleague of mine. His name is Justin Sloan. He is in Hartford in Connecticut. Cool. Uh, so for the onesie twosie stuff, we typically just send it to Justin. Uh, eventually when we have enough business up in those States, uh, we'll just be in the rest of the, of the country from a competitive position. And I know this makes me a bad salesman, but it makes me a great advisor there's so many of these small local mutual companies that only write in certain states in New England that aren't even accessible to the rest of us. So if you're if you're buying property in these rinky dink, you know, small towns that are scattered throughout uh, New England, a lot of the property eligibility guidelines for these really old mutual companies, there's a lot of properties up there that your standard blue blood national carriers will not touch. Uh, and that that goes across the board. If if the property was built in 1860, I guarantee you, you're not going to find a home for it with the usual suspects, including you know all state travelers, State Farm, whatever. You're going to be with uh, you know Leatherwood Mutual of such and such, or you know <laughs> some random carrier that folks outside of New England have never even heard of. Um, so, yeah, if if you got a property that's outside of the 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 normal box, so to speak you're probably best suited with a, a local mutual rather than going through any of these things we're talking about. Got it. So what years and older are usually where it starts to get into that zone? You know, anything older than the 60s, you're probably going to need to get creative. Uh, the problem with the 60s is we get into pigtail and aluminum wiring. Um, and if those haven't been remediated, Folks, just remediate them. There's so many problems that come up with aluminum wiring, even copper pigtails on aluminum. The risk of fire is exponentially higher. Uh, the the currency rating of those old aluminum wires, they were only out for you know, a decade or so. You can always tell the builder when you know when the builders got started because you know before the the 50s, it wasn't like that. And from the late 60s, it wasn't like that either. So it's pretty rare nowadays, thankfully, to find aluminum wiring in a property. But if you do, for God's sake, remediate that thing. Because you're just, you know, hoping a prayer that it doesn't catch fire and, you know, cause a, a major incident or burn the whole thing down. Wow. And uh, coming from somebody that's a fire who've had a fire, it's the scariest call to get. When, you know, my old job, I was pulling into work when I still had my full-time W-2 and I was just hitting the curb 
because you remember where you get these certain calls in your life where things happen. Mm -hmm. And I, the phone rings and I answer it. And it's like the fire marshal of the town. He's like, is this your house? I'm like, it sure is. He's like, well, it's on fire. And I'm like, what? Like, you don't expect to get that call. And when you do, you know, the first things I asked, nobody was home. They didn't have any kids, no pets. So we knew that was great. Both adults were gone. So now it's just a house burning. And uh, when I got there, I was pleasantly surprised. But like what James says, there was smashed windows and hundreds of gallons of water in this house. So now it, it's a great time to kind of pull back for just a second and stop getting into the nuance. Cause a lot of times people's eyes glaze over when you get too far into the details and the weeds of an insurance conversation, the way that we always encourage our, our clients, and our channel partners, the, you know, the, the folks in the investing world that send us business, you know, hard money lenders and property managers and title companies and whatever. We always encourage people to approach this from the, com the perspective of being a risk manager first, because everybody, Everybody is a risk manager in every possible aspect of your life. Every time you step behind the wheel of a car, you're a risk manager. Every time you go to a restaurant, you're a risk manager. Every time you, you know, ask that pretty girl on a date or pretty guy on a date, like you're a risk manager. You're figuring out, hey, is the risk worth the possible reward? When it comes to this investing conversation, all of us need to be risk managers first and buyers of insurance second, because there are certain things that you should buy insurance for. And there's certain things you're better off just putting good operational standards and loss controls in place to minimize the likelihood that any insurance claim or loss ever happens. And then just have a higher deductible on the insurance pol uh, policy and you're probably going to be you know, better off. The, the best insurance claim is the one you never have to file, folks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I want to go over your onboarding process because I could say that one Jen's heart. Yeah. And at first, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be, now that's out there, she was like, are you kidding me? I have to put this stuff. I'm not going to talk to a person. And then after she submitted it and all her talk, she was like, oh my God, this has been fantastic. She went from like 180 direction so quick because of how the process was set up with you guys. And that's one yeah. thing that we were thoroughly impressed. So when you said it, that you're no longer the expert your team is. Well, you do a great job of bringing on some great people onto your team because everybody that we have worked with there has been fantastic. I love hearing that, man. I am absolutely laser focused on the kind of person that I want. You know, my my role is the leader, a uh, coach and mentor, and you know, I'm the one recruiting these folks with with two exceptions, and nobody on this call has ever interacted with either of them. Every single person that works at RiskWell is homegrown talent. They've come in from outside the agency uh, world. They don't have any insurance experience when they come to us. We hire based on attitude and drive and the way that they approach the, the client experience. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to talk to most of our clients. It, most of you that are, are RiskWell clients, you've never spoken to me because my team does such a great job. And James isn't your agent. Ashley is, or Amanda is, or Addie is, or Brecklin before, before Brecklin left. Like, if I got on the phone, you'd be like, who? Who are you? <laughs> it's like, I'm the guy who employs your agent. Um, but just to be clear, you know, we want to be flexible. For the longest time, I was, hey, fill out the form. Or we don't want to talk to you. And one of my mentors was like, you're thinking about this all wrong, kid. You got to do what the client needs within reason. Like if someone meets the basic qualifications to be a client of ours, well, then meet them where they want to meet. They want to hop on a call? By all means, call the office. We'll fill out the form with you over the phone if you prefer a phone. It's certainly faster to do it yourself. But if for some reason you prefer a phone call, cool, no big deal. We've gotten a lot more relaxed at certain parts of the client experience. Because at the end of the day, man, you if you go and post at any of your investing groups right now, Hey, I need an insurance agent. Who do you know? You're going to get every Tom, Dick, and Harry from here to Timbuktu, and it's impossible to tell the difference between them because they all look and sound the same. And as we already discussed, none of them will ever admit that they have no idea what they're talking about the moment you step outside of a very small box they learned about at insurance school. So uh, to me, that's the only way I know how to, to win is you know be the most human agent, be as real as possible, have a good time, and take great care of folks like, you know, treat them like you would your grandma. If you're well, going to treat someone like your grandma, right? you're probably on a good path. I'm just saying. Well, and that's what you guys did. I mean, the, the onboarding process was super easy. Jen loved Love it. it. 
once we, we got with you guys too, even how to go over the policies and things like that, the process was great. So that's why once again, guys, you know, for us, we've had other insurance agents where when we first started doing these creative finance deals, long before we knew James, we had an agent who didn't know what she was doing and didn't have the policy set up the correct way. Mm -mm. So you, we are real life living examples. So the majority of our audience loves these creative finance deals where you're buying them without banks, without credit, but that loan is either in the seller's name still, yep. or they're buying it with seller financing. So you always hear, and I always hear <clears throat> many times, do you get a new policy and put the seller on your policy as additionally yep. insured, or do they leave the existing policy in place and put their name on that. So what do you, your thoughts on the matter? Before I answer that question, because there's a little conversation there that we always run through on these kind of creative financing calls. Do you mind if I hit the chat real quick and clear out some of these questions yeah, let's that have been go. for a little bit? Yep. All right. Jay said, uh, buying policies in your LLC, trust, and or in your names. Uh, tr a trust is a beautiful risk management tool. I absolutely love uh, the trust. I'm not an attorney. I'm not qualified to give legal advice, even though, gosh, I sure sound like an attorney half the time. Um, I'm not. So talk to your attorney and get that thing squared away. There's this little mechanism that's available in most states called a family limited partnership. And you can have a revocable trust tucked inside of an FLP. And man, that thing sure feels like guerrilla warfare out there when it comes to risk management and for your entity structures. Again, I'm not an attorney, so definitely want to package that thing together. The series LLC is available in most states. Uh, we, we like to see the series LLC uh, utilized it uh, it makes everyone's life easier from a risk management uh, perspective because every property gets its own little bucket if you want to get slightly less secure you can put multiple properties in each series and you designate the series you can create them with you know, a single email being sent to your attorney of choice uh, but we love to see the the llc used the problem with your personal name folks is and i know i'm preaching the choir with a lot of people here uh, but jay asked a good question when you have it in your personal name, it is attachable by creditors, and there's absolutely no protection. It is considered a, an approachable asset, and in the event of a judgment against you, if you don't have the right insurance in place and someone has a slip and fall accident and, uh, and you have a judgment against you, most states have some sort of homestead law where they can't take your primary residence away from you. They can't take your primary means of transportation and a court judgment to satisfy you know, dollars against you, but guess what they can take? An investment property that is not your primary residence. So if you have anything in your personal name, I strongly, strongly recommend that you carry it in some form of entity that provides asset protection. And that's as far as I'm going to go there, because if I keep talking, I'm going to sound like an attorney and I am not one. So uh, Jay, your second question here, do I purchase properties through uh, Foremost? We place them through Foremost, I should say. Not the biggest fan of Foremost, namely because their water damage endorsement is really limited. Most states, they cap it at either 25 or 50. I think it's 50 most of the time across the board. But every once in a while, you'll come across a weird water claim that's more than $50,000. Some states have a $100,000 option, but you pay like $275 for that endorsement for that extra water coverage. The base policy for Foremost in most states has just piss poor water coverage. I'm not the biggest fan of that. Um, American Modern has a good policy. I hate to admit it, but Big Red, those state farm agents have a generally a pretty good policy. They're not too friendly with the creative financing stuff. Uh, so you got to make sure that you do your homework and tell the agent what you want to see for first lien holder, second lien holder, because those state farm agents are so by the book. I, I'm pretty sure they squeak when they walk. Uh, none of them. I've never come across a state farm agent that knew what they were doing with creative finance. Uh, you definitely need to be working with an independent agent. Uh, we have some off the books carriers that are not your standard, you know, blue chips that everybody has access to. Lloyd's of London is an insurance marketplace that is based in, wait for it, London, uh, is the granddaddy of all modern insurance companies. A lot of these ENS, Access and Surplus, aka non standard companies, are based on the Lloyd's of London marketplace. Lloyd's of London is not a carrier, folks, it is a marketplace. Think of it as the New York Stock Exchange of Insurance. So um, as far as the, you know, the good carriers to be on the lookout for, that's going to depend on where you are in the country. You know, some of these carriers will not operate in coastal areas or in Florida or Louisiana because, holy crap, there's so many losses out there. And um, I hear from Trace, do East Coast states, do how do they handle hurricane insurance? Typically, uh, they will 
have a separate deductible for named storm or wind and hail, depending on where you are in the country. Here in Texas, we call it wind hail deductible. Elsewhere in the country, it is a tropical or named storm deductible. A lot of carriers will split it out and make it its own policy. So you're going to want to ask uh, the agent if it includes wind and hail and named storm coverage. A lot of agents aren't going to be telling you exactly what is covered or not covered. So if the premium looks really small, it's a good possibility you just bought yourself a policy with no wind coverage. And that includes um, hurricane as well. Very important distinction. If you live at any location where a hurricane and storm surge, if you're anywhere near the coast or a large body of water or rivers or anything else where ground or surface water is a, a risk, you want to make sure you're buying flood insurance because your standard homeowner's policy specifically excludes flood as well as earthquake for you West Coast buyers. So you're going to want to make sure you're, you're making allowances in your budget when you're looking at your, your acquisition, you're looking at your pro forma, trying to do your cash flow modeling. You want to make sure you're making room for these other insurance policies that you may not be considering. You know what? And you're spot on because where we live, uh, this past September, Ian came through. We're in yep. Florida. And right after Ian came through, we we got evacuated and our area didn't get hit, but it got somewhat, not as bad as it did about 60 miles south of us because we're just a little south of Tampa. And uh, I'm out to breakfast one morning with my kids and there's this older couple across from me and there's this lady talking to this other gentleman. She's like, I just can't figure it out. She was like, I have hurricane insurance but it didn't cover the flood damage that she she got when the water surge. So she's sitting there scratching her head, thinking that she was covered because it was due to a hurricane, yep. but because the water surge didn't cover the flood damage, and that's where her issue was. Yeah, I don't know why the insurance industry does it this way, where they break it up into different buckets of exposures. Um, some carriers and without getting way in the weeds and I will lose everybody on this call, including your two hosts, there's, <laughs> there's actuarial data, you know, there's reinsurance considerations. Reinsurance is just a fancy way of saying insurance for insurance companies. When they have a large scale loss, like a hurricane or a tornado or some big flood event, uh, they will declare a catastrophe and that cat or catastrophe triggers the reinsurance where the, again, to our other conversation of primary and excess, the underwriting company that you bought the policy from will be the primary layer, and then they buy reinsurance for the excess layer. So the really bad, the holy shit stuff, all of that uh, gets cast off to the reinsurance. The main reason why we see insurance costs skyrocketing for property insurance across the country, literally every market we're in, has the same problem. It's because the reinsurance companies that back up all the names that you've heard of all of them are hurting. They all have bad loss ratios and the rates they're charging these insurance companies that has the names that you guys all see in your declarations pages and the policies that you buy in the marketplace. Those insurance companies operating costs behind the scenes are way higher than they've ever been. Uh, and that cost gets passed along to you, the policyholder, of course. So if you're like me and you're going, holy cow, why is everything so much more expensive? It's not just inflation. That's definitely part of it. But a lot of it has to do with reinsurance and the operating costs that your insurance carrier has beyond paying out claims dollars. That may be too much information for most everybody on the call, but that's why so much of this insurance across the country in every market simply costs, you know, 20, 30 percent more than it did a year ago. Well, you broke that down beautifully. And that was uh, pretty easy to get. So that makes a lot of sense. And that's the big thing down here in Florida is just the cost of insurance. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of people who uh, honestly for Florida, it, it is a weird thing, man. If you guys are buying property in Florida, just be aware. I say probably 18 to 24 months from now, if assignment of benefits stays on the books and if the legislature in Florida can have the intestinal fortitude and the courage to do the right thing and not be a bunch of little chicken shit, try to get elected people, you know, and go out there and buy votes. The assignment of benefits and the roofing industry in Florida is honestly one of the, and the trial and attorneys and personal injury attorneys, um, they are the two groups that have had massive negative impact on the insurance marketplace in the state of Florida. Because these assignment of benefits, you're essentially, as the policyholder, as the owner of the property, you are essentially participating in rampant insurance fraud perpetrated by contractors. 
and they will just drive up the values on these things and the attorneys get involved. You know, there's something, I don't know how, how old the numbers are, probably about a year old. The last time I saw the numbers, more than 80, 80, 80 87 of the uh, attorney uh, insurance company lawsuits brought by attorneys in the property and casualty world were in the state of Florida, and that's because of assignment of benefits. And these contractors get together with attorneys and basically leverage homeowners as as a, a little milking calf, just teet, 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 just milking the property the the property owners for their own purposes. And in the contract with the roofers and other contractors, you have this little thing called assignment of benefits, where the contractor gets the claim check from the insurance company and you as the policyholder get your deductible waived, which is nothing more than insurance fraud. So I know, sorry, you didn't come on this webinar to hear all about why insurance is effed in the state of Florida, uh, but that's a, a big reason why. Well, and I can see there's just so much stuff that happens. There's tornadoes, there's, you know, hurricanes. It's the lightning stripe capital of the world where we live. So, I mean, there's all types of stuff that just happens here. Yep. I'm going to answer Alexander's question and then I will circle back to yours, Joseph, because I know that we want to make sure that there's time for Q&A from the audience. Yes. Uh, if anybody wants to pop on and do some live Q&A. So, Alexander, you said, is there some sort of checklist to verify that we have good coverage in place? Um, yes, there is. And I, let me see if I can drop this in here. Hold on a second. I have, while I'm talking, I'm going to try to find it here in our, um, uh, sales marketing practices, documents. I'll find it. I'll stick it in here. If not, I'll send it to, uh, send it to your host and they can pass it out later on. Uh, it is a one pager that basically talks about, um, there's six elements you want to make sure uh, you're getting, but the the short answer is just ask your agents the hard questions, make them prove that they deserve your business and let the agent handle it. Here's the thing, folks, you don't have to be an insurance expert. Lord knows you don't want to be, you just want to run your business and build your portfolio and, and you know collect your check every month. You don't want to be an insurance expert. You want someone to take care of it. Same as your taxes, your financial uh, services through your, you know, your advisor, your banker, your attorney, whatever. Don't try to be an expert in all this stuff. Just vet the people that are advising you and let them do it. Um, let's see here. Trey said, would you suggest a high deductible for flood? Yes. If you have the cash position, Trace, go ahead and get that thing high and just cross your fingers. Because honestly, the property insurance costs in Florida are out of control. Absolutely out of control. Even me as an, as an agent, I'm just like, holy crap, it costs how much? Wow. How are people even... How does this even happen? I don't even understand. Like, come on, really? Like, and citizens, which is typically the option for you know the last resort, it is just absurd. I saw one. It was like three hundred fifty thousand dollar home, and they weren't even tier one county. It was like fifty miles from the coast, and it was eight thousand dollars in annual insurance costs for a run of the mill routine property. Not you know nothing special, no mansion or anything, just a, a plain Jane stucco house in some random suburban neighborhood, $8,500 a year. So yeah, sorry, I don't mean to get pulled off sides here. I'm going to answer your question, Joseph. There there are, I think, four. Let me run through my head here. Yeah, there's four steps to making sure that the sub two thing gets done correctly. First is leave the current seller's insurance in place until you replace it. And then wait 10 business days after you have sent everything to the mortgage company and then cancel the underlying seller's insurance after 10 business days uh, and send it off to the lender. You don't need to have double insurance in place. You're creating unnecessary complications there. Also, second thing, make sure you have a signed power of attorney, a limited power of attorney. Uh, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I can't draft it for you, but you need to have a POA with your name on it and the seller where they sign over, again, assignment of benefits in a general sense to a contractor is not okay, but in a purchase and sale contract, the PSA, it's perfectly okay in most states for you to have the assignment of the benefits through a power of attorney document. So the insurance carrier will assign underlying uh, policy claims to you. And third is you need to be listed as the quote unquote property manager. You are the property manager. You are not someone who is buying out the underlying seller because as long as 
the note is in place with the underlying seller's name in place, the lender needs to think that you are the property manager. Now, there's a very thin line to walk here because if you get real specific, we're being dishonest with the lender. So you got to be real careful that you're not outright lying to anybody. That's between you and God and the lender. If you're okay with that, then more power to you. That's not how I run. So the way to think of yourself is property manager, not, I, I, well, hey, I brought this property from so-and-so. Well, that's going to get the do on sale clause triggered real quick. And uh, the last thing is that you are getting your insurance policy. This is step number four here. Your insurance policy with you, your entity, your purchasing entity or property manager entity as first name insured and the underlying seller goes on the policy as additional named insured, not additional insured, additional named insured. And that is an important distinction, folks. So what is the difference there between insured and named insured? Um, and a, a named insured is considered first party from the insurance company and additional insured is considered third party. If, if, if a party is named, then they are on the declarations page. Uh, they are they are right there on the first important page on the policy. The, the distinction is if you only have someone as an additional insured, then the lender is fishing around trying to find where they are on the policy. And a lot of lenders will get weird if they don't see the person's name where they expect to see it. So if you have them as an additional named insured, this does vary by carrier. Some carriers don't have any distinction between additional named insured and additional insured. Most do. Uh, but ask for the uh, underlying seller to be listed as an additional named insured uh, with your agent. So can you see, guys, the reason why they say the success is in the details? And instead of you trying to be the expert in how to figure out all these small, little, intricate pains in the butt, like there's so much stuff to know here. This is why, once again, working with the right agent who knows their stuff is so important in any insurance transaction, but especially taking it a step further to do some of these creative finance deals. So this is why Jen and I have been chasing down James to make sure we could get him on here. And he's been very cooperative. So thank you. But yeah. we saw the importance of, of having this and having this time to really talk about the, the depths of how to do it. And this is not something for Joe and Jen. This is for you guys, right? And this hopefully will get James some business too. Um, because once again, he knows what he's doing and he's going to set it up. So rather you you send him the business or you learn something today and you take it back to your agent to make sure they're doing it right. That's what we're here for. But once again, we had agents before who really didn't know what, what they were doing. And what I'm guessing is when we had an insurance or a bank issue is where they're asking us stuff about the property and one of the properties that we bought on a wrap mortgage. I'm guessing on our policy, this is not one that you were touching yet. No, we don't do wraps because they are so messy. I hate wraps. I hate them so much. There's so many different hands in the cookie jar. There's so many different ways that it can go sideways. The only two do on sale clauses we've ever been around when they got called, both of them were Mr. Cooper for the underlying lender. Mr. Cooper, screw you guys. Really hate Mr. Cooper. Um, I don't have any personal experience with them, but man, they're difficult to work with, generally speaking. And both of them were wraps. Um, we don't do wraps anymore in our office because of two different situations where there was a dispute between the investor, who was our client, and the underlying home buyer, uh, which was also our client. And it put us in an impossible situation because there was an argument over uh, failure to disclose on something and the investor and the, and the wrap buyer were cross with each other. There was a claim and they were both pointing fingers at each other and we were stuck in the middle. And I promised myself at that point, we will never do a wrap again. If I have to pick between the, the investor who brought us the deal and the wrap buyer, I pick the investor because let's look at it, folks. From a business perspective, I'm running a risk and insurance brokerage. Who is a more valuable client, the investor who's bringing the deal or the person who needs a wrap to be able to get their home, who can't do it on their own. So they have to do some creative finance with a crazy high interest rate just to get a house. Which of those two people do you think makes a better client for my office? Right. Your I'll give you a hint. It's one of you. <laughs> so that's why when we are selling our properties, we don't sell them on wraps. Uh, when we buy a deal, we buy them on a wrap, but we sell them on a lease purchase. And there's a many reasons why we always prefer the lease purchase because we get to keep 
a deed of the property. The yep. insurance is in our name. We still get a ton of benefits and that's why our specialty. And once again, I know there's some folks who buy on, on you know, sub two or a wrap and they rewrap it to somebody else and they sell it that way too. And you can, and there's lots of people who do. I'm not going to ever say anything bad about it, but this is why our strategy is the lease purchase. And I was just talking to an investor today um, who I was going over this with because Jen and I had an experience not too long ago where somebody was in the property. They were going to plan on buying it later on. And then their job transferred them to Austin, Texas. And if I sold them that property on a wrap, now I got to go get the deed back. And I got to go through all the stuff to get, go through, you know, to do that, or they got to sell it, right? With us, when it was a rent to own, he says, I know I'm not getting my non-refundable option deposit back. So, and, and I'm leaving for Austin. So you guys get the house back. And then we said, well, listen, you love us. We love you. You guys have been great. We'll at least give you a thousand dollars back to help with the move. And they were grateful as long as you leave the house in nice shape. So that's why when we sell our properties, sell, it's always with a, a lease purchase. And there's so many advantages. We still get to write off depreciation, you know, all the other good stuff too. Um, yep. But this is one of our favorite keys. So spot on. Um, but you can sell the wrap at any time to a note investor. Yes, you can. Um, cool. And then I see Trace talking about how, unfortunately, he's one of the people buying in Florida properties too. Yep. Yeah, um, we're caught up there. Would you suggest? Yeah. So that's why with us being in Florida, we're looking a lot. And boy, let me tell you, you'd better check the insurance policy before you make a deal here because it could get pricey. You're not kidding, man. So, and I have a deal I got to talk to you guys about. So I'll probably submit it to your office because it looks like we're making one here. Um, I'm talking to the seller right after. And what concerns me, it is like two blocks from the river. Yep. Make sure you're buying flood insurance. Oh, I don't think I could buy without it. I mean, this place, if oh, yeah. bad here, boy, this place is going to go under. But it's also two blocks, like one block from the water. So, <clears throat> yeah, Damien, I would love to answer your question about a novation agreement. I can't for the life of me wrap my head around it. I, I, I'm not an investor, so I don't totally understand the novation agreement. Te Texas is not a novation state, so it's not something we come across terribly often. So, um, I'm sorry. That's you stumped me. Great job. You stumped the webinar guest. Way to go. Um now where are you based out of, James? We're located in Texas. Cool. Um so there yeah, we we almost never see novation stuff here. But Pace had him a lot. Uh he's domiciled in Arizona and we got a lot of novation stuff through through those people. Um yeah, I I'm sure it's relatively simple. We just don't get enough of the reps at the plate for it to, you know, make its way into the brains. So I would imagine an innovation because the deed doesn't transfer. Um, it would still stay in the seller's name. If you're going to partner with them on any work that you're going to do, Scott Horn in Texas recommends you sign a, put the property deed into an, an LLC with a partnership agreement. And then you could have a new policy that way. If you decided to go that route versus innovation, there's a lot of yep. different set them up and structure them. But generally that deed on a standard ovation still stays in the seller's name. So I would think the insurance would say the same too. And if you need to add yourself to their policy for X, Y, Z reasons, as maybe a yeah. payoff just in case there was a claim, you could probably do that too. Well, and the insurance follows the deed. Right. And that's as a general rule, wherever the deed is, that party needs to be buying the insurance. So like for lease purchase, for instance, if it's on paper as a lease and the purchase isn't complete until that lease is complete, then until that, that lease purchase is done, the seller, quote unquote, is holding the homeowner's insurance or in this case, investment property insurance. I shouldn't say homeowners because that just confuses the hell out of people. Um, but wherever the deed is, is where the insurance needs to be bought. So if someone's on a lease purchase, the person who is buying the house has renter's insurance. 100% spot on. So our tenant buyers are going to have renter's insurance, us being the owner of the property, still renting until they execute their option to buy. Us being the owner of the property, we're still going to have our um, our policy on it. So, And to follow through on your idea there, Joe, if you're in a JV situation, uh, if if the named insured party on the, on the, the property just needs to be aligned with the JV entity, whatever was created there, and it can be a partnership. It can be an LLC. It doesn't matter what what the entity type is. Um, with most of our our 
programs we have nationwide very flexible on the named insured it, it can be an individual which we definitely don't recommend it can be any other kind of entity including llc and partnership or trust and we're big fans of putting our properties in land trust so you already kind of gave that a shout out so damien oh yeah another good question for you okay let's see here damien's on a roll love it if you buy a property sub two in a land trust do you need to have the original owner as additional named insured i certainly would um, a guy in Philly is telling me he's never done that. Well, your guy in Philly may have never done that, but he should, unless you want to have a big fat problem on your hands. Because what happens when the uh, when the original owner has a document with their name on it, when some third party is looking for the original owner? Yeah. It, it, to me, a land trust or an LLC or a partnership is irrelevant here in this in this use case, because if the original owner has their name on outstanding documents somewhere, yeah, and I don't mean to be a smart ass. Sorry, Damien, if it came across that way. I'm a little direct. Um, yeah, uh, you buy in a trust, you always do it. So yeah, yeah, I would definitely just add the original owner as additional named insured and move on about your businesses. No uh, no need to waste brain cycles on it, right? Well, and, and that's kind of the thing too, is we've, once I've learned from you how to set it up, we changed all of our policies that have them set that way and life's been a lot easier. Yeah. It's amazing what happens when you're dealing with a professional instead of just someone who's hawking candy at the baseball game, right? Oh, tell me. I know. So for now, when it comes to us getting more properties, there's only one place that we're checking. We're sending them right online. Easy, easy submission. So if somebody has questions or they want to maybe get a quote, where's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, if you go to riskwell.com, and uh, let me do this real quick. I'll pull up here on my screen so it's nice and easy for everybody. Let me see here, REI. All right, I, if you will let me share my screen real quick. I need to be given permission, it looks like. You got that, hon? Should be good. All right, good to go. All right, I'm going to go in here. You can see my screen now. I am at riskwell.com. If you go from the uh, from the homepage there, you see my beautiful face. Man, that guy's so handsome. Look at that. You go up here and click real estate investors right here at the top. I'll drop a link here in the bottom uh, over there on the chat. Uh, when we get back over to the Zoom, you can just go straight to it. And then depending on what you're up to, if you're if you've got a rental or a flip or some kind, you've got anything more than uh, four units, one to four unit property is going to be this first one here. If it's anything more, you know, five or more units, we've got multifamily, commercial, new construction, whatever you got, you've got cabins, you know, and Gatlinburg, Tennessee, or whatever, uh, all of your sub two stuff is going to be involved here. Uh, it goes out to this form that loads. And we just grab all the information right here. If you want to uh, get on the phone instead of filling out the form, if you'll see here, we have uh, contact info, then property info, you can do up to four properties in a single form. Uh, we may, we, we've got some stuff happening behind the scenes on the tech. We may have to cut that back to one to make my uh, IT person not pull his hair out. Uh, we'll see. But you fill out this form or you can go uh, to your, uh, not go to, you can pick up your phone and call our office. And I'll drop that in the chat as well. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. Again, you can go to riskwell.com. And our approach really is as simple as, hey, what's going on? What do you need help with? You're not going to find any pressure tactics. Ain't nobody want to get sold anything. The last thing you want is to get some kind of pressure from some idiot insurance agent on, you know, well, you need to buy this. Well, do I? Why do I need to buy that? Well, here's why. So um, we've already got stuff, uh, people dropping off because it's about that time. And you've uh, you've reached your brain's capacity for thinking about insurance. So I uh, dropped the link there. And I will also put our phone number. Uh, let's see here. Call our office at to request a quote. And uh, that's really it, Joe and Jen. Really appreciate the invite. Hope this was worth your time. Absolutely. Thank you. I really just want to thank you again for making it really seamless. It's one of those scary parts, I think, of sub two or creative financing investing. It stops a lot of people. And so just mm -hmm. to have you coming on here and sharing, you know, everything that you just did was super helpful. I know just for me to hear it again, as I'm helping other clients and certainly we know that they're in good hands with you. So thank you for making it an easy, simple process. 
you know, you just told me my kids are cute and I, we've built a beautiful mousetrap here. I'm, I'm proud as I could be for it. So the, the fact that it's working well for a high value client, awesome. That's just validation of what we're up to. So anything else I say is just bragging and nobody likes that. So I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> well, you're the man. Thank you so much. Once again, you've been a great to work with and your team has been great too. So we've been super pleased. So guys, once again, definitely check out James and his team. You'll be happy. Rather, you got a fix and flip, one of these creative deals going on. Um, we highly recommend them. And we are not just saying that, but we are current customers and we are thrilled. So thank you guys for coming on this Tuesday. If you have any more questions, you know where to get a hold of us. You know definitely where to now to get a hold of James for all your insurance needs. And uh, we will see you next Tuesday. We got a surprise coming next week. So can't Ooh. wait to share. And it's probably more interesting than insurance. <laughs> Just kidding. Nothing's more interesting. Nothing. <laughs> well, great seeing y'all. Thank you so much. We'll see you next have week. Have a great day. Y'all take care. Bye.